The Ape That Understood the Universe is such a fantastic book that I've read it three times. It's the story about how the mind and culture of the strange human animal evolved. In the first chapter, Stuart Williams uses a literary trick that you may or may not like. An extraterrestrial alien perspective is used to get a helicopter view of humanity. Whether you like this trick or not, you should ignore any annoyance and press on. It's absolutely worth it. The knowledge and overview presented in this book will help most readers make a quantum leap in their understanding of the human animal. If you ever get close to a human and human behavior, sings Icelandic singer Björk, be ready to get confused. However, Stuart Williams' book just might help you dissipate some of the confusion. The aim of his book is to sketch out an explanation for human behavior and human culture that has a decent shot at being accurate. And Stuart Williams, in my humble opinion, hits the mark. In the second chapter, Stuart Williams presents a series of hypotheses, each inching closer to the one that will allow you to pass and excel an exam in his evolutionary psychology class. The first hypothesis is that evolution is about the survival of the species. Evolution is not about the survival of the species. It's not about the survival of the fittest individual animal either. In the end, the hypothesis that will give you an A in his class is hypothesis number 6. Evolution is about the survival of the fittest genes. Genes are selected if they get themselves copied faster than rival alleles, that is, faster than other versions of the same gene. Think of adaptations such as sharp teeth. They are designed to help pass on the genes giving rise to them. Designed by natural selection, that is. Simply put, if sharp teeth helps an individual animal survive long enough to procreate, another animal with genes coding for sharp teeth is born. Of course, being cute may help as well, especially when humans play a role in selecting who gets to breed. Stuart Williams also explains a number of useful concepts, like the concept of evolutionary mismatch. Here's one example. Hedgehogs evolved a defensive mechanism that served them well for many years. Rolling up into a spiky little ball will effectively deter most animals from eating it. However, when caught in the headlights of a car, this is not the best possible response. A little spiky ball will not deter a car from running it over. It's probably better to run. The hedgehog's defensive mechanism is therefore a mismatch in an environment with cars and roads. In the third chapter, The Sexy Animal, notice the clever spelling, Stuart Williams tackles the currently controversial viewpoint that men and women on average are different. He lists 10 common sex differences found in the animal kingdom and explains how they could arise as a result of either evolution or culture. The average differences? Males and females differ in size. Males in many species have a stronger sex drive. Females are often choosier. Males are frequently more ornamented. Think of the peacock's tail. This helps attract more females. In many species, males pay for sex. Here, a male bowerbird has built a home to attract females. Males are generally more aggressive than females. They fight each other for access to females. Males often have built-in weapons, like supersized fangs. Females grow up faster than males, and they tend to live longer. Females do most of the caring for the young, for obvious reasons in mammals. How do we explain these average differences? Are they caused by biology or culture? Stuart Williams argues that many of these differences can be explained by biology, though he gives due credit to cultural explanations when called for. Let's look at an example. The larger sex drive of males. Is this a result of cultural influence? Are we actively encouraging the male sex drive in our cultures? Or is it to some extent built into human biology? Does a large sex drive make equally sense for males and females trying to spread their genes? Well, for both males and females, the best way of spreading genes is to have as many offspring as possible. However, males can impregnate several females in nine months, whereas females can only have one pregnancy in the same period. For females, it therefore pays to wait for a superfit male in order to increase the likelihood that he will actually help look after the offspring. From an evolutionary perspective, it does not pay for a man to wait for a superfit female, as this will not help his genes spread further. A larger sex drive is therefore genetically more advantageous for men, which suggests a biological explanation for this difference. Here we have to remind ourselves of the naturalistic fallacy, that if something is natural, it must be good. Let me stress this. 
Just because something is natural, that does not mean that it's good. I think it was Sam Harris that said, there's nothing more natural than being mauled by a bear, which is obviously not good. Maximizing your genetic potential is not automatically a moral good either. In chapter 4, Stuart Williams talks about the dating, mating, and baby-making animal. Men and women evolved not simply to make babies, but also to look after them and love them. Why do we look after them and love them? Well, the short and perhaps controversial answer is that organisms evolved to pass on their genes. Genes are only passed on if they survive long enough to create another copy of themselves, another baby. That's at the very least one important reason why we frequently stay together as couples long enough to look after our babies into maturity. A frequent argument for evolutionary over cultural explanations is that we see similar sex differences in other animals and cultures. If culture was the explanation for the average differences we see in humans, you would perhaps expect sex differences to be different amongst animals or other cultures. But they're frequently not. We see size differences, choosier females, more aggressive males, and so on, across cultures and in other animals. According to Stuart Williams, evolution can also help explain a painful concept that characterizes humans. Jealousy. Jealousy is an emotion, and the function of emotions is to motivate behavior. What kind of behavior does jealousy motivate? From an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense to see jealousy as motivating mate guarding. Males make sure fertile females are not impregnated by other males. Females make sure that males do not wander off when they should be helping to raise their common offspring. What about altruism? Chapter 5 is all about how we can explain altruism in evolutionary theory. Does evolutionary theory not predict that animals that look out for number one are more likely to spread their genes? Why is there any niceness at all in the world? This is where kin selection theory comes in handy. Our kin have copies of genes that are identical to genes in ourselves. If we are nice to kin, if we help kin survive, we are also helping genes identical to our genes survive. We share 50% of genes with our children, 50% of genes with our siblings, and 25% with half-siblings. Human beings, however, are not made by genes alone. We also have culture and memes. Chapter 6. The Cultural Animal. What is a meme? Broadly speaking, a meme is an idea or a unit of culture. It can be more or less successful in making copies of itself. In memetics, the idea is that we help certain ideas, memes, to make copies of themselves. Could be a funny cat video that we help along its way to success by viewing, liking or sharing it. It could be apple pie. Apple pie is a type of meme. Many people like apple pies and will make them again and again, share recipes and pictures. Thus the apple pie meme continues to exist for as long as we can continue to make and share it. Some memes are selected in a process similar to that of gene selection. When we make a new boat, we will often copy the design of a boat already made. However, we do not copy boat designs of boats that sink. So some boat designs, some boat memes if you like, do not survive. We also do not copy behavior that led to the death of other members of our species, like ignoring the law of gravity. Teddy bears is another example. We have over time made teddy bears cuter by buying the ones we thought were most cute, or most baby-like if you prefer. Non-cute teddy bears are no longer sold, so the memes of less cute teddy bears did not survive. Genes and memes, however, are not completely separated from each other. Genetic changes can catalyze mimetic changes and vice versa. Human beings, more than other animals, are a result of gene-meme coevolution, and Stuart Williams presents examples of this in his book. Biological evolution is about the survival of the fittest genes, and cultural evolution is about the survival of the fittest memes. Like genes, memes are selected to the extent that they have properties that make us repeat them. Here's an example. Some cultures, perhaps in times of great need, had the idea to start drinking milk from other mammals. Those able to digest the milk survived, and were more likely to procreate. So here's a cultural idea that increased the number of people with lactose tolerance. In other words, an example of culture reshaping the body, and we have every reason to think that it can also reshape the mind.
That was Nonfiction Takeaway from The Ape That Understood the Universe by Steve Stewart Williams. I only covered a small fraction of the interesting facts in this book. I highly recommend reading it. More Nonfiction Takeaway to come. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, share and like for more Nonfiction Takeaway.